much everyone for coming along this evening and indeed any of you who are in the ether welcome to um, it's my pleasure this evening um, to host a joint meeting of the North Stats Classical Association and the local branch of the Western Front Association and I extend a warm welcome to members of both groups this evening and I hope we're going to have a talk which addresses the interests of both um, and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Professor Angie Hobbs, who probably needs no introduction, and she's a well-known um, figure, I think, in academe. And uh, Angie is a philosopher, I think it's fair by trade, Professor of the Public Understanding of Philosophy at the University of Sheffield. Um, the most important thing, I think, from this evening is not perhaps the uh, Plato a Ladybird Experts Guide, although I'm sure it's very well worth reading, um, but her work on a long-standing project about um, the classics and heroism and the First World War, and I think it's fair to say that um, this talk, and I believe there is an academic paper which lies behind this talk, and I'm sure anyone who's interested in that will be able to post up details of that afterwards, um, has generated this sort of material. So what Angie's going to talk to us about tonight is, as you can see, who lied, classical heroism and World War One. I'm told there's quite a lot of Wilfred Owen in this, but you've not come here to listen to me, you've come here to listen to Andy, so I want to hand over without any further ado. Andy. Thank you very, very much. Stephen, am I standing where you want me to? Yeah, that's fine. I'm just showing you at the start. <laughs> <laughs> so, and welcome anybody who's watching virtually. So yes, so thank you so much for inviting me. Yes, I have a job in the public understanding of philosophy, but actually part of my academic interest has always been in notions of heroism and courage. So when in 2013 I was invited to get involved in a White Rose uh, project on classical heroism in World War I, I, I leapt at the chance of involved supervising various PhDs, but also I wrote a couple of papers in the process, and, and this is one of them, the other is on women and heroism in World War I. And this the academic paper on which this is based uh, was published in 2018 in a special volume of Classics Reception Journal, edited by Miss Pendrick Leeds. And yes, do get in contact if you want that paper. Right, so, Boris <coughs> Odes, 3-2. Dulcet de quorum est pro patria mori. Mors et fugar quem persequitur virum nec parcit in bellis juventi populitibus timidove te. It is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. Death catches up with the fleeing man just the same, nor does it spare the cowardly youth's knees and fearful back. And here, we have Owen, early poem, 1914, before he, he didn't uh, join up till 1915, he didn't go out until the end of 1916. So this is pre his fighting experience, the ballad of purchase money. O oh, meet it is and passing sweet to live in peace with others, but sweeter still and far more meet to die in war for brothers. That's what Owen writes in 1914. However, we get to 1917, it was published in 1918, so the first version is in 1917, and his famous Dulcet de Corum Est. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear in every jolt the blood come gurgling from froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile and incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. So spits it out, doesn't he? Really spits it out. Okay. Now, so the kind of the, the traditional view of what happens to Owen and other ardent young war poets between 1914 and 1917 and 18 
has been called by Vandermeer in a very fine study, Stand in the Trench, Achilles, about classical receptions in British poetry of the Great War, and she calls it the old paradigm. This is the, the traditional narrative. And this says that the young soldier poets of World War I entered the war all buoyed up by ideals of honour, heroism, and patriotic self-sacrifice, only for those ideals to be just blown apart by the squalid realities of 20th century combat. And the disillusionment was not only with ideals of honour and heroic death in general, it was also, as in Duque at the Quorum Est, specifically with the articulation of such ideals in the classical canon of ancient Greece and Rome, the canon taught, of course, in public schools and grammar school curricula, William Woodford Owen, a grammar school boy. Uh, when you see Dulce at the Quorum Est with capital D's, I'm referring to Owen's poem. If you see it with lowercase d's, that's me quoting from Horace's own now this paradigm takes the attitude of the character of Bonamy in Virginia Woolf's really fine novel, Jacob's Room, which she published in 1922. This paradigm takes his attitude as representative of a much more widespread disenchantment. Bonamy, in a famous line, is said to draw, quote, no comfort whatever from the works of the classics. Now, although that section of the novel is pre-war, Wolfe makes it absolutely clear throughout the novel that classical education is put on trial by World War I and in some serious respects found wanting. And the accusation is also that a classical education isn't just useless, it's positively dangerous because it's fine but specious phrases, according to this view, lure the innocent, idealistic use to grim, filthy, inglorious deaths. So according to this narrative, the old paradigm, World War I did irreparable damage to the perceived value of a classical education. And I think it's no accident that in Jacob's room at Cambridge University, he's pressing the petals of poppies, of course they're going to be poppies, in a Greek dictionary. So that's all very delight, you know, very nicely anticipating, of course, the fields of Flanders where the poppies lie. But what I want to do this evening is, to some extent, challenge the old paradigm. So I want to ask some questions. Who precisely is Owen accusing of lying? And is he justified in that accusation? And further, is Dulce at Decorum S, is that representative of Owen's general approach to classical literature? Specifically, is he seeking to do away with classical notions of patriotic heroism because he thinks they're no longer of service in industrialised, mechanised 20th century warfare? Now, at the very end of this talk, I'm going to touch on Owen's attitude to heroism in general. Because after all, he states in a draft preface to a proposed volume of his poems, he states specifically, this book is not about heroes. Well, is that true? We're going to be looking at that. Is that really true? Are Owen's poems really not about heroes? So we're going to come back to that at the end. But I'm mostly going to concentrate on his attitude to the classical canon in general, and Horace in particular. And one of my main hopes is to, one of my main aims is in fact to pay more attention to Horace himself than is usually the case in discussions of Owen's Dulcet de Quorum S, which, though it's known that that's quoting Horace, it's, it's strange how little Horace is talked about in discussions of that poem. Now, not all World War I critics of Horace's Dulcet de Cormes go as far as own. They don't all call it an outright lie. And in a very fine poem, I think, How Do You Sleep? Scaling poem. Graham dismisses it as a platitude. Dulcet de Coram, he said to you, then put the deed apart with a platitude out of our hearts. 
or sent it shivering round the cold back door of charity to claim its unavoidable reward. O oh, men, O oh, brothers, always was it thus, even from the faint, first faint flicker of the world that sent the blood cry ringing down the ages. For us, for us, and never a word of doubt. So that's Graham, M.P. Graham's But Owen is adamant. It's not just the platitude, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, but Owen is an outright lie. So who does he think is telling it? Now, I think the key to uncovering the main target, or possibly targets, of Owen's school lies in his choice of the word children. Because if the friend, he says, had seen what Owen has seen, then she or he would not tell with such zest the old lie to children ardent for some desperate glory. Okay. But this friend, therefore, can't be Horace. Because Horace isn't telling an old lie, even if it is a lie. It's not an old lie, and he's not telling it to children. Horace's Odes may be old to us, uh, books one to three of the Odes were all published together in a rather heroic year for Horace in 23 BCE, um, but they're obviously not old when he wrote them. The friend Owen has in mind is someone repeating the lie to children now. Furthermore, Horace was primarily not writing to children. And in fact, he mocks the whole idea in Satire's 110. He explicitly says he doesn't want his work to become a school textbook. Bad luck for us. Uh, <laughs> although in Epistles 120, he jestingly predicts that this might be his fate, as indeed it was. I mean, he, I think he knew he was going to be used in schools forever and ever. Maybe not anymore. I, I read Horace in school, but um, very happy I did. So if Horace is not primarily addressing children, then who is? Okay, so we'll come back to whether Owen thinks Horace is lying and whether that's justified, but what we have established so far is that Horace can't be the my friend talking to children. So that we have deduced. Does Owen simply mean the teachers who use Horace for their own patriotic and imperialist ends? <laughs> Well, I'm sure such teachers are included in the vocative, my friend, but I think there are more precise targets too, because earlier drafts of Dorquet de Quorum Est are dedicated with particularly savage irony to Jesse Pope, and even more scathingly to a certain poetess. Don't know how many of you know about Jesse Pope. You, I'm sure you probably do as your Western Front Association members. She wrote verses mainly aimed at boys and young men and the parents and girlfriends and sisters who might influence them. Yes. You know, her oeuvre includes Jesse Pope's War Poems, 1915. More War Poems, 1915. Maybe her Tour de Force, Simple Rhymes for Stirring Times in 1916. Terrifying. <laughs> now, in all of these, she exhorts laddies, as she calls them, to dash off to glory for their native land and its empire, fired up by a lethal, literally lethal, concoction of sanitised classicism, romantic chivalry, and muscular Christianity. Now, particularly, I won't inflict too much Jesse Pope on you, but a particularly disturbing example is The Call. Who's for the trench? Are you, my laddie? Who'll follow the French? Will you, my laddie? Who's fretting to begin? Who's going to win? And who wants to save his skin? To you, my laddie? Who's for the khaki suit? To you, my laddie? Who longs the charge and shoot? To you, my laddie? Who's keen on getting fit? Who means to show his grit? And who would rather wait a bit? To you, my laddie? Who'll earn the empire's thanks? To you, my laddie? Who'll swell the victor's ranks? To you, my laddie? When that procession comes, banners and rolling drums, Will stand and bite his thumbs. With you, my laddie? Now, the call was first published for the Daily Mail on the 26th of November 1914. And the Mail uh, frequently published Pope, it was her favourite vehicle, 
And Owen says that he regularly uh, received the mail while he was teaching and tutoring in Bordeaux 1913 to 15. Because when the First World War started, um, Owen was you know, living a very comfortable life in the French provinces as a, as a tutor, reading the mail, reading Jesse Clark. Now, Pope wasn't the only one serving up this particular group. And in Clifton Chapel, which some of you may know, uh, 1898, Sir Henry Newbolt appears to be filtering Horace through a romantic screen of medieval chivalry and Christianity when he invents an entirely fictional plaque for the very real chapel of Clifton College. Uh, my father and grandfather both went to Clifton College. I've been in the chapel. It's a very fine building. There is no plaque. This is entirely Newbolt's imagination. And this fictional plat reads, Qui proper hinc legends writ, the frontier grave is far away. Qui ante diem periet, sed mille, sed pro patria. Who perished far from here and before his time, but a soldier, but for his country. Now Newbold is well aware that the simple phrase pro patria is going to evoke memories of Horace's line in his target audience in the future officer class. He knows that they've all read that ode at school. And it's so well known, that ode, that he doesn't even have to quote the whole line, don't get the foremost for a patria and all Just saying pro patria, they're going to know the ode, to just bring it up. So Newbold is happy, or at least prepared, to recruit Horace, to persuade healthy and life-loving boys that it will be a sweet and fitting thing to lay down their lives for a potent ideal of patria which fuses notions of country, empire, and school. I mean, at least in Jesse Pope's The Call, she's envisaging the young person surviving the war and taking part in a victory parade at the end of it. I mean, alas, not many did, but at least she's envisaging that they will survive. Newbold has got this plaque in this great big boys' school, you know, saying, well, he died way before his time, but he was a soldier and he died for his country. So Newbold is celebrating the death of this young man. Okay, obviously not in the First World War, it's written in 1898, but <coughs> some imperial war. Now, Clifton Chapel, and particularly the tag, said Mille, said Pro Patria, became very widely known and loved and used both before and after World War I in letters and articles as well as poems. And Vanderbilt is, is really good in Stand in the Trench Achilles in pointing out that not all the World War I poets were as critical and hostile as Owen and Sassoon. That there were people who really did take succour and, and nourishment from these kinds of patriotic poems, even after they had fought. So that there is a mixed response, as you would expect. Now, it's highly likely that Owen was also responding to Newbold, whom we know he read, and on other occasions even admired. And the list of Owen's likely targets may well also include those who influenced Newbold, because in his memoir, My World as in My Time, Newbold admits that his approach to classics is from the Romantic side. You think? Okay, originally inspired by his love of stories about the Greek heroes and the lays of ancient Rome. Notice that word, lays. Because Macaulay's Lays of Ancient Rome was first published in 1842, and their tales of heroic and patriotic deeds have been hugely popular ever since. And uh, my friend, the, the, the very distinguished uh, ancient historian, Catherine Edwards, has found 63 editions of Lays of Ancient Rome between 1842 and 1939. And my father, who was born in 1918 when he was uh, dying, he asked me to read to him in the final days of his life more than once at uh, Horatius at the Bridge. He really found it moving. And, and my father was an immensely cultured and cultivated and well-read man, but he, at the end of his life, he wanted to call you. So this stuff does help you. So, it's important to bear that in mind. Not everybody has the same response to it that Owen might have. Macaulay himself, however, is, to be, let's be fair to Macaulay, he's careful in his preface to disentangle Roman attitudes and ideals 
from Christian and medieval chivalric ones. He writes, The old Romans had some great virtues, fortitude, temperance, veracity, spirit to resist oppression, respect for legitimate authority, fidelity in the observing of contracts. <laughs> okay, some modern politicians can look at that. Disinterestedness, <laughs> ardent patriotism. But Christian charity and chivalrous generosity were alike unknown to them. Well, obviously Christian charity is going to be unknown to them. I, I think it's a little unfair to say that the Romans had no notion at all of charity or generosity, but you, you get the point. Macaulay is not trying to lump all these ideas together in the way that Pope and Newport do. He's trying to disentangle them. However, unfortunately, many of Macaulay's admirers, including Newport, were either unaware of his preface, which is very likely if they were introduced to him as children, I mean, children don't tend to read prefaces, um, or they chose to disregard it. And they blithely included Macaulay in the very fashionable late Victorian, Edwardian, and Georgian amalgam of classics, Christianity and chivalry. And o Owen certainly seems to mock the lays of ancient Rome, in particular in his, I think, very disquieting poem, Schoolmistress. And in this, the teacher bleats on about Macaulay, Horatius, and the brave days of old, while snobbishly refusing to respond to three real working-class soldiers who speak to her through the school room window. And, and Owen very mischievously calls one of these working-class soldiers Horace. <laughs> so, so, I think we can say with really quite a lot of confidence that the my friend whom Owen sardonically addresses in Dulcet de Formes is primarily Jesse Pope. I mean, after all, he had literally dedicated earlier drafts of the poem to that. But, but also included in that my friend are all those such as Newbold, certainly and possibly Macaulay, and assorted teachers who recruited the classics and classical notions of patriotic death in general and Horace's Dulcet de Coronest in particular. In order to seduce impressionable youths into thinking that dying for one's country is sweet and heroic, but it is, in Owen's view, <coughs> filthy and inglorious. But what are the teachers and authors up to? Are they necessarily lying, as Owen claims? And I don't believe that's fair. I don't believe that even Jesse Pope or Newbold or Macaulay can fairly be depicted as lying. It's certainly true that none of them chose to embrace a sweet and fitting heroic death for themselves, uh, but their views can be held without contradiction, particularly if Dorque and decorum are interpreted in a moral rather than a superficially aesthetic sense. So sweet and, and, and fitting meet uh, they can have a purely aesthetic meaning of something that's sort of pretty um, and decorous, but more often than not, they have um, a moral sense. Actually, and I've got a footnote in this in the academic article, it's clear that Owen, in a letter that he wrote to his mother, that Owen is thinking of the aesthetic sense as well as the moral sense. He really hates the pretty part of war. He, he really loathes that. And indeed, the views of Pope and New Bolton Macaulay were even endorsed by some who had taken part in the conflict, who, who went on thinking that this was that this poetry was fine and this sustained them and helped them in the trenches, and they didn't reject it in the way that Owen and indeed soon do. But fair or not, this is Owen's stance against his main targets. He thinks they're telling an old lie to children, and he despises them for it. What are his stance towards Horace? Does he think Horace himself is lying? Now, even if Horace is not the my friend trying to fire up children with a passion for self-sacrifice, Owen still scathingly dismisses this line as a lie. So it is clear that he does think Horace is telling a lie, even if it's not the old lie, and even if Horace isn't the my friend. Is Owen justified in accusing Horace of lying? And again, I don't believe 
that he is Horace may perfectly well believe Dulcet the Cornest Cleopatra Mori, even as someone who has taken part in military combat himself, as he did at Philippi in 42 BCE, when he fought on the Republican side uh, with Brutus um, against uh, Octavian. And he witnessed deaths in that ferocious battle at first hand. I mean, Plutarch says that I think there were 20, in his Brutus, I think he says there were 24,000 deaths on the first day alone. I mean, it was a horrible battle. However, there's a complex narrative here and one that needs unravelling. And as far as I'm aware, it hasn't been unravelled. And I'm trying to unravel it. And if I'm wrong and other people have unravelled it, do please tell me. Because it's precisely Horace's experiences at Philippi, which inform another ode, 2-7, also published, if you remember, in 23 BCE. When 3-2 is read in the light of 2-7, as it would have been by Horace's original audience, of course, all published in the same year, it takes on a very interesting new light. Because in Odes 2-7, Horace cheerfully admits that at Philippi he very definitely chose not to lay down his life. His courage cracked, he says, cracked a virtus, and he beat a swift retreat, abandoning his iconic shield in the process. He tossed it away. Now, we don't know how accurate this story is, because Horace may be emulating his poetic heroes, uh, the archaic Greek poets Archilochus and Archaeus, who both claim in their kind of satirical lyric, well, their lyric poetry, but very sardonic lyric poetry, that they did the same, they chucked away their shield, refused to be heroes. But the historical accuracy doesn't actually matter. What matters is the close proximity of the two owns in publication and the light that each sheds on the other. Now, this doesn't mean that Horace is being necessarily disingenuous when he writes Dulcet to Cornest because it's perfectly possible to admire ideals which you recognise that you don't live up to. But it does show that his treatment of war in general and life and death in war is a lot more subtle and teasing and elusive and hard to pin down than is often supposed by those who only know 3-2. It may even be that, and I just give you this suggestion to think about, but when confronted by imminent death at Philippi, Horace decided the Republican cause of Brutus and Cassius was not, in fact, the cause of what he understood to be his patria and not worth his life. So he may want his readers to reflect clearly and deeply on what patria really means and what is really worth dying for. So if Horace is telling any lie in 3-2 then, it's not necessarily in the line Dulcet de Cornes pro patria mori. However, if we read 3-2 in the context of 2-7, we can see that he may perhaps be guilty of, if not exactly a fit, at least giving a false impression in the lines that follow Dulcet de Coram. If you recall, he went on, Death catches up with the fleeing man just the same, nor does it spare the cowardly youth's knees and fearful back. These lungs give the impression that death will hunt down the coward as he flees. And that definitely did not happen in Horace's case when he ran off without his shield at Philippi. On the contrary, 2-7 tells us that the messenger called Mercury very helpfully wafted him clear of the enemy lines deposited him safely home to enjoy drinking excellent massive wine at merry parties with his friends. He was not hunted down by death. He had a grand old time. Right. So, Horace. Pretty complicated. So not a... Can't be accused of lying and don't care to call an S, but telling a little bit of not quite the whole truth. Being a bit elastic with the truth of the lies. Back to Owen and Owen's view of Horace, but also Greek and Latin literature in general. Is Dulcet de Cormes, Owen's view, is that representative of his general view of Latin and Greek literature? 
Do you want to answer them? No, not entirely. There were many aspects of classical culture which fascinated Owen, an acquaintance with which he felt to be necessary to his development as a poet. He made great efforts to study Latin after his formal Latin education stopped at 14. According to Sassoon, he wasn't very good, but he did try. And on, I mean, Sassoon had been to Malta, I mean, a top private school and was a bit snobbish about all this. And on the 12th of June 1912, Owen wrote to his mother that he longs to learn Greek, whose spirit giveth so much life to poetry. Now, Vandiver, the author of Stand in the French Achilles, she argues persuasively that in Strange Meeting in Spring Offensive, two other really great poems by Owen. I mean, there are so many really fine poems. What a tragedy he was killed in 24. She argues that there are deliberate echoes of Odysseus's visit to the underworld from Odyssey 11. And that in Strange Meeting, there are also allusions to Achilles' powerful and moving speech to Lycaon in Iliad 21, which I still really cracks me up every time. I can't read that speech without crying. It's when Achilles sort of says, don't plead for your life, look at me, you know, look what a fine, amazing man I am, but I'm still just about to die. And there is some dawn or noon time or evening time when I'm going to die. Also, Owen's, this book is not about heroes, preface notwithstanding, Owen was particularly interested in classical mythology and the heroes of those myths. So his library, we know what his library he left, it included King's List of Heroes, Charles King's List of Heroes, which was also probably influenced uh, Newbolt as well, and the Comte Fabuleux de la Grèce Antique. And Owen also worked for years on a long poem about Perseus and the surviving fragments of another poem that wrestlers tell of the battle between Heracles and Antaeus. Now, all these receptions have one thing in common. It's particularly Greek heroes and authors who fire Owen's imagination. Okay, of course, these heroes start off in Greek mythology and then are transposed into Roman mythology, but it's particularly the Greek versions of them in Greek authors that Owen seems to be inspired by. In another letter to his mother, written after attending a Catholic service in France when he was still being a tutor out there, he writes, it would take a power of candle grease and embroidery to Romanize me. The question is to un me. Um, I think in his mother's ears, he simply means to divest me of my passion for Greek culture and literature. I suspect with his own personal satisfaction, he's referring to his sexual orientation. But his mother was very pious, and I don't think he explicitly wanted to acknowledge his sexual orientation to her. And he also writes to a cousin that J.O.K. Thompson's The Greek Tradition is a glorious book. So he loves a lot of this stuff. So Owen found tales of particularly Greek myths and heroes useful for some of his poetic purposes. Nevertheless, it could still be true that he felt classical literature in general conveyed to sanitize the notion of war and death in battle. Okay, would that view be fair? Well, I mean, Greek and lit Latin literature does not shy away from the gore and the anguish and the moral complexities of war. Plenty of moral complexity in the Iliad. I mean, look at Achilles saying to Priam in Book 24, what am I doing here? You know, creating orphans. Why am I here? Um, and it certainly doesn't shy away from the gore. I mean, clearly the the audiences who went to hear the Rhapsodes reciting Homer were just sort of loved all these gory scenes. However, Owen may still have thought such tales inappropriate for depicting the new conditions of industrialised 20th century warfare, and particularly inappropriate for depicting death in such conditions. He may have thought that the realities of modern trench warfare and gas attacks offered fewer opportunities for heroism and none for a sweet and fitting patriotic death. I mean, that's clearly speculation on my part, but I, it, I'm trying to see where he might be coming from. If this is his view, then he might well have thought it perniciously deceptive 
to employ classical heroic ideas to mask the filthy banality of anonymous, and we'll come back to that, it's crucial, the anonymous death and dying in trenches. Now, the fact that such a view is understandable does not mean that it can't be explored, because the question of whether a gruesome death and a gas attack can ever be regarded as sweet and fitting is clearly just as much a matter of subjective response as Owen's anger at that response. It, it, it's perfectly um, possible for somebody to think that dying for your country and the courage that shows and the values that shows means that it's sweet and fitting to die even a gruesome death and a, and a gas attack. That's not, an, it's not an impossible view to hold. It's not one, a view that Owen holds. It's not an impossible view. However, the question of whether classical ideals or any ideals of heroism can survive the filth and mass death of the trenches is an issue open to more objective considerations, not just subjective ones. And I examine that in some detail in, in my academic article, Who Lied Classical Heroism in World War I. But we can hear, and so I'm not going to go into the, that in detail here, but we, before we end, I can just briefly note two issues that raise questions for classical conceptions of heroism. So a working definition of heroism that I give is something like doing or creating something which can reasonably be perceived to be of outstanding benefit to your community or a subsection of your community in which most people simply can't do or create. In other words, there needs to be an objective element of doing something which can reasonably be perceived as benefit, but also a subjective element. People need to regard you as a hero. There's a subjective quality to being a hero. People have also got to see you as a hero. So in the extreme, and another uh, condition would be that traditionally heroism has been supported said to, to do with the supererogatory, meaning going beyond the call of duty, that courage is about performing your duty, being a hero is going beyond that. Now, in the extreme confusion, the thick murk of gas, many of the actions could not be attributed to named actors, and many of the deaths were anonymous. So that raises the really deep philosophical question, can there be unsung heroes? Do heroes need to be named to function as heroes in their society. They certainly need to be recognised in general. Do they need to be individually known? And the mechanisation of war, in some cases, not all, but in some cases, increased the role of chance and reduced the opportunities to display skill. Of course, skill was still required. But you, you could argue there was more chance in whether you lived or died. And but that doesn't stop very great courage, of course, still often being displayed. So those conditions might have raised questions for the traditional classical conceptions of heroism. Now, there were, of course, still heroes in World War I in a recognisable classical mould, such as particularly the fighter pilots, uh, such as Cecil Lewis, who starts up the BBC and does many other things. I mean, extraordinary life. Um, and actually, Owen says that you know, with going into the Air Force is the only kind of military job he could see himself going into at the end of the war. However, it is, I think, at least right to question the general applicability of classical models of heroism to terrestrial fighting conditions in World War I. However, that doesn't mean that World War I reduced the opportunities for in instances of heroism per se, and I would argue that on the contrary, the fighting conditions of World War I widened the scope of what could be perceived as heroic beyond the classical archetypes. The appalling, relentless and prolonged fighting conditions were so terrible that even simply doing one's duty, not just going beyond it, the supererogatory, but just doing one's duty, could reasonably count as heroic. So I believe it's per perfectly possible for us to read Dilkert de Coromest and others of Owen's war poems and forge a new, broader conception of heroism from them. 
whatever Owen's own view, I think it's possible for us to take this material and form a new conception of heroism. For example, the soldier trudging on through filth and gas and noise and brutal deaths, day after day despite appalling odds. The patient minds of the girls, as, o as Owen beautifully writes, who scatter tender thoughts on their sweethearts like flowers. A really exquisite line, pulling down the blinds each slow dusk, day after day. Now, if being a hero involves in part being viewed and treated as a hero, as I suggested above, that there needs to be a subject as well as an objective element in being a hero, then to function as heroes in their society, the unnamed and unknown do at least need some kind of vehicle by means of which their society can commemorate them. And of course, such vehicles exist. There are various tombs of the unknown soldier around the world. And what I want to suggest for your consideration tonight is that whatever his own intentions, the poems of Owen, and in particular, Dulcet de Forn S, can serve as another such vehicle of commemoration. Now, in another ode, not 3-2, but in 3-30, Horace claims that in his poems he has created a monument more lasting than bronze. That's, he says, you know, I shall not wholly die. There's going to be a bit of me that's going to live on. <clears throat> Whatever Owen thinks of Horace, I would suggest that they have both created such monuments. And they have both thereby given us the opportunity to validate certain human qualities, including the capacity for heroism. Now, the precise forms that heroism takes in any generation will adapt to the changing conditions that call for it, and particularly the changing conditions of war. But, and hopefully this will give us some hope in a pretty dark period in the world's history at the moment, but the ability of humans to rise to those challenges, to rise to the call of heroes, that ability endures. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you very much, Chair, for a very, very stimulating talk. Um, frustratingly answering several of the questions I was raising ahead <laughs> went along, but no matter. Uh, what we would normally do now in the branch, and I propose to continue this practice, is to go through um, a few housekeeping announcements to, to let Angie catch her breath and then I think she's kindly offered um, to yes, yes, take sure. questions afterwards so um, what I will say and I'll say it again after the housekeeping is that we're still streaming um, so the questions will go out there into the ether um, so if you don't want to be in the ether so to speak they said do hold your peace but um, otherwise um, it'll be um, a Q&A session when we finish but first of all if I may um, Anyone who hasn't got a copy of our programme for this year, there are a few on the table, so please do take one along. And again, as I've said, um, if you were to put down an email address or anything in, in the little book, if you've not done so already, you'll be added to our mailing list. So, obviously the nights are drawing in. We've got one more formal event um, before Christmas, and that's... Um, a talk by my former colleague Dr. Shushma Malik, now at the University of Cambridge, uh, entitled Is Nero in the Bible? And uh, we're doing this with the Potteries Theological Society. Shushma's come and spoken here before. She's a very lively speaker, so I, I would strongly commend that to you. And that's on the 14th of December, a Thursday. Again, it will be here, although not in this room. It will be higher up in this building. Um, at um, 7.30, which will give you a chance, of course, to depenetrate the chairman if you wish to do so. Um, that um, is then the end of our proceedings until the end of February, when we have Dr. Jane Seglia coming to speak about Ancient Greece's next top model. Uh, in between, I don't have news at the moment, but I will draw uh, people's attention to the fact we have both a Latin and a Greek reading group. Um, if you want information about those, please contact myself or Stephen and we'd be happy to give you the latest news that we have. 
I think that's really all I need to say at this point. Maybe though, if I just invite um, John to briefly tell us, because Western Front will be having a meeting next month as well. Um, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I can't remember the, the actual theme, but uh, um, could somebody remind me of, of, of what we're talking about in December? It's called a nuclear scientist tool, question mark, which basically about a scientist who uh, volunteered for the army and he became a range finder, he developed range finder. Okay, so uh, a nuclear scientist war question mark, and uh, that will be the second Monday in December. Yes. Correct. Yes. So um, on that note, I think I'm done with um, housekeeping notices. I don't think I've forgotten anything. Um, so um, as I say, Angie's kindly uh, offered to field questions. Do be aware again that those questions are going out into the ether. So uh, I invite questions. And just to say that because of it being streamed. Um, we don't have a mic to hand around. I will probably repeat your question. That's not because I lost my mind. It's, it's doing it for the streaming and then for the YouTube. That's why your question might be repeated. John? It's not a question, it's more of a comment. If we take your definition of heroism, Owen would fall into that category. I mean, he was awarded the military cross. Oh, yes, yes. And he was awarded the military cross for simply handing killing the German machine gun crew. So uh, from the point of view of a, an experienced warrior who actually gets his hands dirty by killing people on the battlefield, he falls into that category. As would Sassoon, who was also yes. another military cross. Yes. No, absolutely. They... I mean, one of the things that I encounter in my Western Front experience is people who think that the war poets, because of the Poems were actually pacifists. No, no. Um, and, or, if not pacifists, and people. So, just to make the comment that very rarely is it brought out that some of these poets, in the classical sense, were military heroes. Yes, thank you. So, the comment's just been very, it's just been made that Owen and Sassoon and others, they may have loathed war and written coruscatingly about it, but they themselves. Um, you know, did heroic acts by any definition, and certainly by my definition, and I would agree with that. So Owen may write in his preface, this book is not about heroes, but I think it's written by a hero. I agree with you. It's, it's complicated. Thank you. I, I was interested when you were talking about um, heroism, you were talking about superarrogation. Yes. And I suppose I was wondering a bit about the relationship between the two, because I think one might be tempted to think that Heroic acts are almost by definition super erogatory, but maybe not all super erogatory acts. Not every act of going beyond one's duty is necessarily heroism. So I'm just, I'm just wondering if you can say a little bit more about how those two do or don't overlap. Thank you. So the, the question is about the relationship between mm. heroism and the super erogatory going beyond one's duty, and um, the claim has been made that. Um, According to some definitions of heroism, her heroic acts are super erogatory, but not all the super erogatory acts may be heroic. Uh, yes, so, so certainly in the traditional view, heroism has often been linked to the super erogatory, which has made it a real problem for philosophers of ethics, uh, particularly if you're following Kant or Kuhn, the only way of doing good is to do your duty to do duty for duty's sake. So according to Kantian ethics, where does heroism fit in? And it's complicated in utilitarianism and so on as well. So traditional, in fact, virtue ethics probably has the most capacity to try and accommodate heroism, but it has traditionally been a real problem. I certainly grew up for most of my academic life. I worked for the model that heroism was about a super robotry going beyond your duty. But I came to at least partly change my mind when I worked on this project for four or five years. As I said, we were working with PhD students in this wide rose classical heroism in World War One network. So we were really involved in this material for several years. And I came to wonder if that was that the conditions of doing your duty in World War One were just so horrible and so prolonged and so relentless that maybe even doing your duty in those conditions could after all 
So I came to question the traditional model which I had offered. So this work on, on World War I actually made me wonder. And I haven't reached a firm conclusion, but I think it's at least possible that there are some conditions in which doing your duty can just work. So thank you for that. And I certainly agree with the second point. Not every supererogatory action is, is uh, necessarily heroic because you know there's got there's got to be that notion of some thing which can reasonably be perceived as a benefit to your community, um, which most people simply can't do. And there may be things which are either not that beneficial or which in fact quite a few people could do but are still going beyond your duty. But thank you, that was that's really good. Thank you. Just again, it's points really rather than the question. And it's building on from what John was saying. And so I've only been reading this this afternoon, so I'm by no means an expert. But you know, thinking about you know, the awards of the Military Cross, uh, a reading in this that uh, when he was recommended for the Military Cross, Owen wrote to his mother, and he said, I lost all my earthly faculties and fought like an angel. Which just you know, when you're talking you learn about classical heroism, mm. you know, just made me think about the book. Yes. And also, uh, earlier uh, in his service, in his active service, uh, he, uh, he was uh, diagnosed with scalp yes. and, and went home. Yeah. And it says in this book here that uh, there was an air of you know, cowardice that he, you know, that he felt that he carried. Uh, uh, with, you know, with his contemporaries and his peers. And then again, writing to his mother and being recommended to the MC, he said, I came out to help the boys, these boys, by leading them, Dire sorry, help these boys directly by leading them, indirectly by what their suffering that I may speak to them as well as the account, I have done the first. But so then he was trying to throw something up. Yes. Yes, so thank you. So the comments there on yeah. Owen's own experience of war that uh, for when he was recommended the military cross, he wrote to his mother that he lost all his earthly, what is it, his earthly faculties and fought like an angel. I mean, definitely one of the ferocious angels, sort of St. Michael kind yeah. of sword wielding angel. I mean, there were some pretty tough angels, weren't they? Um, but also that when he um, had to be invalided out because of shell shock for a while, uh, that he had very complicated views of sort of guilt over that, and the suggestion is maybe he's trying to atone for that wrong, as we would see it, completely misconceived feeling of guilt. I mean, shell shock was so poorly understood, so poorly understood. Um, I think I think those are very perceptive comments. So I I agree I agree. But I mean I would say that thank goodness by World War Two at least there was a bit more understanding of shell shock and the fact that you know humans that we we evolved we're designed to cope with very high levels of stress for short periods of time. But what we're not designed to do is cope with very high levels of stress relentlessly. We're not designed for that. It's the relentlessness of it. And it's quite interesting. A lot of them write and talk not even about the relentless fear. They almost became inured to the fear. It's the noise. The fact that their senses are just being assaulted. The smell, the, the noise of it all. And we're, we're just not evolved to cope with that. And that might be part of the point about this, these new conditions of warfare. I mean, war has always been very noisy, but I mean, this was just on a new scale. If I, if I may, I'd, 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 first of all, I'd like to agree with that. I mean, a, a little bit ago, I, I made an argument that ancient soldiers didn't suffer what we understand as PTSD precisely because the stress of an ancient battle is an hour, not a 24-7 phenomenon. But if I may, just going on to what you said about Owen and his classical education. Yes. I, the obvious top chap wouldn't be Horace, but would be Virgil. 
And the interesting thing there, it seems to me, is I mean, the end of the Aeneid. Now, I personally don't think that it's anything like as problematic as other readings, but I think the other readings here are the pertinent ones, would say that here we have a man set up to fight a patriotic war, but at the very, very end, when he kills his rival Turnus, everything becomes very much more ambiguous. Yes. Uh, now, at one level, you might say that that is a text which undercuts the narrative of the patriotic war. Mm -hmm. Do you feel we can detect anything of Virgil in Owen or indeed any other poet of the Great War? I mean, do, does that voice have a resonance as well, or is it just the Horace that we should be focusing on? No. I, I'm very happy to stand corrected. I can't think of Owen making particular use of Virgil. He certainly makes, I think, use of the Odyssey and the Iliad. Um, I, I can't think of one. I mean, I, I, do, can you think of one? I can't. No, I cannot. That's what. That's why I'm, I'm sort of searching or wondering whether anyone else did, did no. this well, because I, of I, this. I'm not quite aware of, but let me look in Van Der index uh -huh. if we've got Virgil at all. But it's it's interesting. You're absolutely right. We end with we end with Turnus's uh, soul. You know. His shades disappearing. But mind you, the end, and, and the, he also Virgil is copying the Iliad, mm -hmm. which ends with the death of Hector. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tabor, of course, doesn't it? You know, it's really interesting. These two great, allegedly patriotic poets end with empathy for the opposing side, the hero of the opposing side. Really, really interesting. Okay, so I can't answer your question. I've not come across it, but I'm looking in Vandeveur for Virgil. I mean, the thing is, we don't know. I mean, the honest truth is, we don't even know for sure that Owen had read all of Horace's Ode 3 2. Even in translation, let alone in mm. Latin, he may just have looked in that tag. Um, we know he read some other stuff. We don't know if he read that, and he tended to read translations of Greek, and his Latin wasn't that good. So Virgil, Virgil. There are no, there are yes. There's obviously a bit of Virgil. She does. There is Virgil and Vandervers in index, but I can't think of Virgil mm. in reference to Owen. Oh, thank you very much. So, that, I'm, that, I'm sorry, that, but no, 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 no. Uh, knowing knowing there is an absence final. is as valuable sometimes as knowing yeah. that there's something is present. So. So, well, I know I may be wrong, but that, that's, I'm not aware of Owen and Virgil. If I, again, just building on things you said, I mean, Henry Newbolt and, and, and the education of children in this way, I mean, yes. one can't help, I mean, I'm sure other people in the room as well, when you mentioned that, can't help but think of the beginning of All Quiet on the Western Front, where, yes. you know, we, we go to a gymnasium and, and yes. the, the teacher is urging people in this way. Do we have, I mean, I, I, my Germany is appalling, I've got my hand up now. Um, do we have any resonance of this sort of stuff in German literature? Um, you know, that, that, the, the, the deceitful use, if you like, of education to, to push young men. I mean, obviously there is this, this novel and this film, but beyond that, is, do, we, do we see that as a theme or not? No. There is... I'm not aware of that. I'm aware that there were people in German cultural life in World War I who were horrified by what was going on and recruited the classics to critique what was going on. So Euripides' Trojan Women mm. was definitely put on in Germany in World War I, which is really interesting. Now, who is, there's a wonderful scholar at Leeds University who is the absolute world expert on Germany's use of the classics in World War I, and I will remember so, um, otherwise, I can't, I mean, it's not just the Romans, so on, apparently on London buses in World War I, Thucydides' uh, Periclean funeral speech appears on the side of London buses to recruit people. So there was a general sort of recruitment, I mean, relying on the knowledge that at least the grammar school kids as well as the public school kids had read a lot of this stuff. So I can't, 
answer that, but I do know somebody who can, so I will get back to you on that, but thank you. It's an amazing work of art, so it's designed to, to move very deeply. I think deep. I think the song myself, and I often think if he was called up now, the service like they were back there, and a hundred years earlier, the Napoleonic Wars, we took this with his scarf to press down into fighting, bullied, and to always club, to fighting in the battle of Trafalgar, um, and you know, the other the Navy battle at that time. Of, and the views when we got that um or to me and you were sort of mentioned was more of a thing. Um sorry I didn't want to be I know I often put myself in that situation because if I was a model that the I don't know first of all the Napoleon be going off to fight um you know what, what would I be thinking of thinking about that you know I know this still but I mean, at those times when it was not like expected of you, and a hundred years early, what was it as you could expect something mad not to do his duty? I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, to put yourself in, 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 that, in that situation. I mean, we were written, um, I knew she lost her, all the men, mm -hmm. close to her, her, her fiance, brothers, and was a king of all these. How, how we get how we get back home, how we get any of this, um, you know. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so very, very powerful and eloquent points are being made about how difficult it is for us to imagine ourselves in these war conditions and how great works of art like Blue Part on the Western Front or Bear Britain's Testament of Youth can make sure that we, we empathise but don't judge too much because it's very, very difficult. I think the point is being made that we should be very wary of 
transposing our own moral perspectives and values onto situations that we haven't experienced and we don't know how we would react in them. Is that fair? Yes. Yes. Thank you. No, thank you for that. Sorry, no, no, no. It's very <laughs> much. No, but the, the, the writers of these works, this is this, they want to move people to compassion. Sorry, the testament to here, if I remember in my teenage years, absolutely, what you were about, was it Carol Campbell? Oh, I know, I remember mm. her. Yeah, that. Yes. And I remember the scene when she just, she when she finds her brother has died, she just sort of, I think it's the brother rather than the fiance, she just sort of yeah. falls mm. down. The last story, mm. yes. it? the last story, it's like, have just this, what more is going to come? What, what what further death, what is what else who else around me is is um, you know gonna you know be and they went through all that and then they had a pandemic which killed even more people mm. than the whole of World War One. They must have thought the gods hate us. I mean just imagine what it would be like in nineteen eighteen and nineteen ninety, you've just come out of this horrific slaughter and then this virus appears, we barely even know it's a virus, which kills between 50 and 100 million people. Mm -hmm. I just thought for one thing, this is about heroism also, when we when you were questioning who is like the whole thing I use for me, is it yes. Well really, without all that propaganda rhetoric, but not as you call the literature of that time, it's been quite across the picture that um, someone turned um, your country to you. you. Yes. Do, I mean, have you seen the amazing, I mean, one of my favourite films is Oh, What a Lovely War, which is an extraordinary film, all these jaunty tunes, but yes. what messages, what yes. messages, mm. and I remember the really terrifying music hall, I mean, singer, who looks quite glamorous from a distance and really quite rough face up, and she's sort of beckoning, you know, but yes. in a quite a threatening way, quite an intimidating yes. way, yes. getting these young guys to come up, sort of at the promise of sex Thank if, if they enlist and then they get close up and find me. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah, the, the final scene. What that yeah. said about the scene, she said the absolute, sorry, biting and ingredient for some of the, you know, the characters. Of, and obviously they love you now, but really, the humour, we think, oh my God, you know, but I think, would we really, you know, Yes. The line in that, you know, right. he says sardonically, but well, today we move General Kate Spring's cabinet four inches close to Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember that line, yes. Thank you. Sorry, yeah, I, I knew all the various bits between uh, and uh, and uh, uh, Thank you. Any, any other questions, comments? Uh, yeah, just just briefly, uh, going back to who uh, Owen's targets were, I mean, apart from the writers of what sounds truly dreadful poetry, trying to, in well, yes, rhymes, shall we say, uh, encouraging people to go. Of course, the very first mass encouragement to enlist came with the posters of Kitchener. Yes. The great military hero, uh, general officer, You'd think retired, but field marshals never retire, of course. Yes. Uh, to, to what extent do you think that Kitchener and, and other leaders of the army were also targets? Not, well, I mean, not, not in Owen's point. No. no. He, he's talking to somebody who's talking to children. Yeah. And, and that's what's so terrible about them. And the old yeah. lie, do, they, and, and they were repeating this line of Horace as the recruiting tool. I don't mm. think Kitchener was no. recruiting, was, was quoting No, he didn't, he didn't quote any um, classical so. tags, did he? I don't think so. Just your country needs you. I, I think, I think yeah. so. I don't think he's in Owen's sights. He's, I think he's, you know, going back to the guilt question. <laughs> so he, he's been sort of innocently reading all this Daily Mail stuff for ages. No, he didn't do anything for ages, did he? He died at 24, but by his lights for several yeah. years, without particularly questioning it. Then he's suddenly thinking, oh my God, 
what's going on mm. and what's really happening here. They're trying to persuade young, healthy young boys that this is a, not just maybe a necessary thing to do with their country, but a sweet and decorous and, and pretty thing to do for their country. So, and you said that, uh, you know, healthy young uh, things, so it's like, young pretty young, it's, it's almost like totally wrong that the, 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 you know, the young people, the, 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 you know, barely, a lot of them actually still were children, do stories like 14 year old, but we weren't actually over, you know, within the people age to serve, but, but this, uh, this need to, you know, to do their duty, but also, um, the series, some years ago, all the books, there's a drama series. Yes. Um, um, I think it's a Ben's greatest character in the world. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. I remember the series, the uh, series, sorry, um, was it uh, on train when he was um, taking trips to, to, uh, to Paris to meet the French? And he said they were bathing in a in a I, I remember my my so the comment here is about just the poignancy of such young people going off to fight. Now I remember my father who had fought in World War Two in Burma, and when the Falklands War started, I remember he and a couple of his friends who were then in their sixties, they were close to tears, and and these were tough professional men. These were not given to, you know, they were tough men, but they were close to tears. And they and they said, and they were only half joking, that they didn't think wars should be fought by young men. They wanted wars to be fought by old men who had had their lives and had, they said, young men, they've got their lives ahead of them, they may have young wives, they may have young children, wars should be fought by young men. And they were quite saying to each other, they said, we could still you broke, use a rifle, and they would literally say, oh, I could still load a rifle, I could still use a rifle. And they really, you know, they were only half joking, they couldn't bear it. And I remember my father saying that in, when he was out in, um, he was obviously in Indian for years, but he was in, in Burma, obviously, and, and the new kind of, you know, young sons would come out, and he started off always trying to get to know them knowing their names and finding out about them, he said an older soldier took me aside and said, you mustn't do that, don't get to know them, you won't because they're not going to survive most of them and you, your mental health won't survive. You can't get too involved with what a job to do and if you get too involved with who these young guys are, then you're not going to be able to cope when they get killed. And he knows it was just so the irony in saying to me more than once, the worst thing about war is it ends up morally anaesthetizing you because you simply can't you simply can't cope. It's, it's overwhelming, isn't it? You, we, you know, we protect ourselves. We cannot cope. To, to keep doing our jobs, we just can't yeah. stop. We have to stop feeling it so much. Sorry, comment there. <laughs> comment, indeed. I'm going to stick up for being a military historian. Um, to say that there isn't a great expression of the actual understanding of what went on with both recruitment and warfare on the Western Front. For example, after the Somme battles, so we're looking at the end from 1916 to 1918, the average time a soldier spent in a frontline trench was two days a month. The actual time he spent in the front line that's frontline trench, second line trench, yeah. and reserve was 11 days a month. The rest of the time he was either training or labouring behind the lines, making roads and all the rest of it. So the idea of troops being in the trenches seven days a week, all the time, under bombardment, just doesn't hold water. Um, early on in the war, it was slightly different because we didn't have enough men. Yes. In terms of recruitment, major recruitment in 1914 when the war broke out didn't really start, this is recruitment of civilians, 
didn't really start until the end of September. The war was declared on the 4th of August. The army fought its first battle in France on the 23rd of August. It was a month after that before recruitment of volunteers really took off. And most people, most young men who joined the army were joining it predominantly for economic reasons. Britain was in a major recession in 1914. Something like 30% of all the factories were closed and another, I can't remember the percentage, but another fairly high percentage were working part-time. So young men recruited, went into the army because it provided money, both for them and their families. I mean, I'm doing some research on Cornish miners who were recruited as panelists. Uh, the average wage of a Cornish miner in 1914 was something like the equivalent of three to five shillings a week. If they went into the army and were recruited as a paneler, the army paid them 36 shillings a week. And most of the tunnelers that I'm studying in Cornwall were married men. So it's fairly obvious why they went in for tunneling. Mm -hmm. Because there wasn't a lot they could do with the money in France, so they could remit most of it back to their wives. So it's this complex social picture that is not really reflected in popular culture. And that's the only point I would make. Well, thank you, and I think that's for, that's... That's really helpful. I would still say, picking up Andy's point, that even if you're only doing frontline trench duty two days a month, the point is you know that the next month you're going to be doing it again. You're not just fighting a battle at Philippi. It's going on and on year after year. It's that, the length of it all. Which, but anyway, but th thank you. And then that point about the... Um, the money, I think that is really important. That's really helpful. Thank you. I have one last question, I think, it's really, but Sally, I think, is wanting to ask a question yeah, over there. Yeah, just to know, how was Owen's poem received at the time? Was there any criticism of, of his description of the war? Or... Now, that is, now, I don't know the answer to that. Does anybody know the answer to that? So, I don't even know. So, he revised it. I asked the rider to that. Well, that's I just go down. You just... may know is how famous was he just after the war? So some people say the war poets grow in the late twenties and thirties. Yes, in popularity. exactly. I mean, mm. so well, poem was practically unknown until was it C. Day Lewis who published exactly, mm. exactly. Mm. So, we, and I've got the C. Day Lewis here. Um, I mean, I don't even think he saw the publication. So he wrote it in twenty seventeen. He revised it. In, Sorry, 1917. He revised it, thank you, in 1918. I don't think he even lived to see the publication. So, now Sassoon, I mean, Sassoon, his poems were better known more quickly, weren't they? I mean, there was, you know, I. there was so much bitterness, there was so much jewelness, it probably would have fitted in, I think, with, I don't know. So he had a network of supporters within the literary. He did. No, no, I mean, I'm, I can imagine, though, you know, a parent who's lost their child reading this mm -hmm. and thinking, I, you, you can imagine people being quite disturbed by it. <coughs> and it would not be what they would want to read or hear. But I, but I don't think it was. I mean, I don't know the answer, but I don't think it was very well known for really quite a long time. And I think it is true. It's this edition, the, the forward by Day Lewis, one poet to another. It's a terrific edition that really kind of brings this into well, the light. Maybe on that note, we have, we have a professional classical philosopher here, but ending on a note of Aporia seems to be a, a, a very yes. fine way uh, like to draw things to a conclusion. So I think we've had an awful lot to think about um, tonight. Um, quite a lot of topics, perhaps, for both societies to explore in the viewing. Mm. Humour and black humour and how it operates in society might be one, for example. Yeah. Um, but what I'd like to do is extend uh, my, my thanks, and I hope I can associate it all with that, to, to Angie for coming to talk to us tonight, and I'll ask you to thank her in the traditional fashion. <laughs>